Very well. So let us start talking about exponential functions. Recall that, let's just write a quick review of different types of functions that we learned in this class. We talked about, well, a linear function. which is denoted as y equals to mx plus b, or you can use the function notation. The function notation here, instead of y, you can use f of x. Remember that f acts like a machine. You plug in some values into your f input values. Your function change those input values and give us some output values, f of x or y values. We talked about linear functions. Then we introduced the quadratic functions. A quadratic function is defined as f of x equals to a x squared plus bx plus c. Then we said that, hey, we can define power functions power function of the format f of x is equal to a x to the n. You can plug in 3 for n and get a power function of degree 3. Or you can change it by 4, substitute 4, and get a power function of degree 4 or so on. We also talk about absolute value function. Absolute value. The function absolute value is an example of a piecewise defined function, and this is denoted by an absolute value of x. Number five, well, we talk about, for example, square root function, square root f of x is equal to square root of x. Remember that when you have square root, we're going to talk about this later, but when you have square root, and inside the radical, you cannot have a negative number. All of these numbers must be positive or zero. Today, we're going to start talking about an exponential function and its inverse logarithmic function. An exponential function is defined as f of x equals to b to the x. b is called the base of this function. b is called the base. Remember that if b is larger than 1, then we have an increasing function. The graph of the function behaves like this. It starts increasing from left to right you have an increasing function however if your base is in between zero and one you get a decreasing function the function behaves like this it starts decreasing from left to right for example the difference between f of x equals to 3 to the x and f of x equals to a third to the x. The difference between these two is that the base in this case is 3, which is larger than 1, and the base in this case is a third, which is in between 0 and 1. You are interested in evaluating these functions. So to evaluate these functions, you can just plug in the value or use the calculator. For example, if you have function f of x 3 to the x, let's take a look at this. You use a table, you plug in some values for your x, and then you evaluate f of x, which is defined as 3 to the x. You're allowed to plug in any number that you like for x. 
we can plug in zero for x. When x is equal to zero, it means that we end up with three to the zero at power. Any number raised to zero is just one. So what's the meaning of that? It means that point with first coordinate zero and second coordinate one is on the graph. Let's plug in one for x. Wherever we see x, we're going to use one. We get three to the first power, which is just three. So what's the meaning of that? It means that point with first coordinate one and second coordinate three is on the graph. Let us plug in a negative number, why not? Let us plug in negative one for the x value in the domain. Three to negative one is equal to one divided by three to the positive exponent. Three to negative exponent is equal to one divided by three to positive exponent. It means that the point negative one and the third is on the graph of the function. As you can see, negative one gives you a small y value, a third. At zero, we have one. At one, we have, for example, three and so on. It gives an increasing function. However, if we use, for example, let me write down the second function here for you, g of x, let us call it g, a third to the x. Remember that the general behavior when b is in between zero and one is a decreasing function. B or the base is a third between zero and one. We can use a table. We expect the graph to be decreasing graph. If you use a table like this table, but instead of f, we're going to use function g. g of x is a third to power x. Again, let us begin plug in some values like what? Like zero. Am I allowed to plug in zero? Of course, why not? If I plug in zero for x, my g becomes g of zero or a third to power zero. Any number, any non-zero number to zero is one. What's the meaning of that? It means that the point zero and one is on the graph of my function zero and one. Let me plug in a positive number like one. If I plug in one for exponent, I get a third to the first power or just a third. At one, I have a third. What if I plug in a negative number? Why not? I want to investigate to see what is the behavior of my V, my Y, if I plug in a negative number. So a third to negative. Guys, if you have a negative number, you can flip your fraction. You get three with positive exponent. So what's the meaning of that? It means that negative one and three is a point on the graph of your function. Negative one, and as you can see, your y is an increasing y. One and a two. That's how we evaluate an exponential function. We plug in different values, for our x and we find the output value or the y value. Now let us go over some algebra here. So first of all, any non-zero number raised to zero is always zero. So any non-zero number. If you take any non-zero number raised to the zero at the exponent, my exponent is zero. This is your exponent. It's always equal to one. For example, pi to the zero at power, one. Napier number to the zero at power, one. A third to the zero at power, one. 
negative one over 12 to the zeroth power one. Name it, square root of two to zeroth power one. Complex numbers to zeroth power one. Two plus pi three to the zeroth power one. One over square root of five to zeroth power one. Any non-zero number. But note that if you have zero raised to zero, it is an indeterminate. Indeterminate. We're going to deal with this guy in calculus. Calculus. Okay. Let's talk about fractions a little bit. In general, we define a to power negative n as one divided by a to the n. So if you have any non-zero number raised to a negative exponent, you can flip that and write it like this. For example, if I have two raised to negative one, this guy becomes one over two raised to positive one. If I have pi raised to negative two, this becomes one divided by pi to the second positive second. So negative exponent on the denominator becomes positive exponent. What if I have a fraction? What if I have a half to the negative three? You can flip your fraction and it gets a positive exponent. One, two divided by one raised to positive exponent. If you have negative five divided by 12 to negative, for example, one, this guy becomes negative 12 over 5 to positive exponent. So in general, if you have any non-zero number raised to a negative exponent, you can write it on the denominator with positive exponent. Some algebra to go over. And in general, you can write it this way. Here's some general information. If you have m, over n to a negative exponent, like negative k, this becomes, just flip this, n over m to positive exponent. This is always true. Let us talk about an exponential function and its inverse. Before talking about an exponential function and its inverse, we're interested in showing that we have an important property. In this property, we're going to show that a function passes horizontal line test. So I'm going to erase this one to avoid any confusion. One, two, one, function. So a function is one to one write it this way one to one if it passes horizontal line test. Again, guys, do not confuse this with the definition of function. Recall that for a relation to be a function, it must pass as vertical line test. For a relation to be a function, it must pass vertical line test. Now we are moving to a new terminology. 
one to one function. We say that a function is one to one if it passes horizontal line test. It means that any horizontal line has at most one intersection with the graph. Example. Which one is a one-to-one -one function? Okay, I'm going to give you a bunch of functions. The first one is this guy here. I'm going to give you an exponential function. This is an exponential function, like increasing exponential function. It means that the base is between, is larger than one. What about this guy? This is your B number B. For B, I'm going to give you a linear function, a decreasing linear function. C is going to be a quadratic function. C behaves like this. Quadratic function. And D is square root function. D is square root function. So which one is one to one? Which one passes horizontal line test? If you take a random horizontal line, it has at most one intersection with the graph. So this is your horizontal line. It passes the test. So any exponential function is one to one. What about your line, linear function? Any random horizontal line. You have a horizontal line. It has at most one intersection with this line. So it is one to one. What about this quadratic function? Well, unfortunately, any random horizontal line has more than one intersection. So this is not a one-to-one -one function on its domain. If you think about negative infinity to positive infinity on this domain, it's not one-to-one. -one. Okay, what about this square root function? Any random horizontal line has at most one intersection with the graph. So it is also a one-to-one -one function. Very good. So what's the algebra behind this? This is the graph. We are visualizing the graph and we understand that if we check one random horizontal line, it must have at most one intersection with the graph. Otherwise, we have a non-one-to-one -one function. So the algebra behind it is like this. The algebra says, if y1 is equal to y2, then we can conclude that x1 is equal to x2. Very good. So just take a look at this. Here you have y1 equals to y2. Am I right? The y value for this point and this point are the same. The same y value. But as you can see, your x values are different. One of them is positive, and the other one is negative. That's why this guy, a quadratic function on its domain negative infinity to positive infinity is not one to one. So note that the quadratic function, or in general, any function of even degree or any function of even degree is not one to one. So it means that if I use y equals to x squared, y equals to x to the fourth, y equals to x to the sixth, and so on, none of these are one to one function under domain. Why do I keep saying that under domain? So 
guys, if you restrict the domain of a quadratic function to be only positive, then the behavior of the graph is like this. Then it passes horizontal line test. If I ignore positive part, just look at the negative part. On the negative side, if I restrict the domain between negative infinity to zero, then my graph is one to one. It passes horizontal line test. That's why I keep saying that on its domain, you have to mention that, hey, the quadratic function is not one to one on its domain. Later on in calculus, you see that, hey, they are restricting the functions to a smaller domain and they make the function to be one to one. So why being one-to-one -one is so important for us? If you have a one-to-one -one function, you're allowed to find its inverse. So what are the steps to find an inverse of a function? So let us write the steps down, inverse function. I'm going to write two examples at the same time here, so you can follow what's going on. Example, and another example. So your first function, f of x, is given to you as 2x plus 1. And g of x is given to you as, let's see, like square root of x on the given domain, x is larger than equals to zero. So both of these two functions are one-to-one. -one. First, you have to check that. The first function is a one-to-one -one function. The second function is also one-to-one. -one. So what are the steps? Step one. Let y be equals to f of x. Okay. So I'm going to write down y equals to 2x plus 5. I'm going to write down y equals to square root of x. Step two, switch x and y. Okay, switch x and y. So what should I do? Here I have y. I'm going to write down x. Here I have x. I'm going to write down y. I have equality. I have two. I have plus. I have one. So I'm switching x and y. Here I have y. I'm going to write down x in term instead of y. Here I have x. I'm going to write down y. I have equality and I have radical. So I just switched x and y. Step three, solve for y. Okay, I'm going to solve for y. I have two y equals to x minus one. Now I have to divide everything by two. So my y becomes x minus one divided by two. I'm going to solve for y. Y is inside the radical. I have to raise both sides to 2 to the second power. So I get x squared equals to y. Last step. Instead of y, write down inverse function. Instead of y, write the inverse function notation. Well, inverse function notation, what is that? Inverse function notation is written this way. You either have f with a little negative one as its exponent, but it doesn't mean one over f. Guys, f with negative one as its exponent is not 
1 over f. Very good. So instead of y, write the inverse function notation. My function represented by f, so I'm going to write down inverse of f evaluated at x equals to x minus 1 divided by 2. Instead of y, use the inverse function notation. So my function notation is g. Inverse of g is g inverse. So this guy becomes, let me use a different color, g inverse of x equals to x squared. Very good. There's an algebra behind it. How do we visualize that? So let's take a look at Desmos. What is the visualization here? What is our observation? The first function was 2x plus 1. So let's copy this down. 2x plus 1. And the second function is x minus 1 divided by 2. Okay, let me put this in parentheses. Divided by. So this is my original function, and this is my new function. It's inverse. Now let's take a look at those two functions, square root function, square root function, and x squared. Just note that for your x squared, you have to ignore the negative part. So this is my original function, which is square root function. And this is half of x squared function, half of quadratic function. So let us take a look at this. These two functions, the inverse of f and f, they are symmetric with respect to the line y equals to x. So these two functions are symmetric with respect to y equals to x. It's always true for any function and its inverse. Again, for g and inverse of g, these two functions are symmetric with respect to the line y equals to x. As long as you have a function and its inverse, this is the property that satisfies these two functions. They, have, they had a function, we created a new function, what is the property? The property is that they are symmetric with respect to the line y equals to x. OK, so now let us talk about composition of functions. Before talking about composition of functions, we're going to introduce a new function that we call the identity function. identity function. This function is defined this way. I representing the identity. It takes x values and it gives you x values back. So whatever you plug in to identity function, it gives you x back. It acts like a mirror. It takes your x, your input value, and it gives you the exact x value as the output. What's the use of identity function? Note that if we compose f and the inverse of f, the output is the identity function. So 
So composition of F and its inverse, recall that. If you have a function like F of X equals to two X plus one, if at a is equal to 2a plus 1. We just do the simple substitution. f at b is 2b plus 1. We just do a simple substitution for x. If I ask you to find f of x squared, it means that wherever you see x, you're going to substitute that by x squared. This is equal to 2x squared plus one. This is the composition of f and x squared. So let f of x be two x plus one. Let g of x be x squared. If composed with g and x is just a substitution of g into x. We just take g and substitute that in f. You represent it this way. f of g of x. f of g of x. Or f composed with g of x. Just a simple substitution. Here, we substitute g into f, and we get 2 x squared plus one, which is a simple substitution. This is a composition between two functions or just simple substitution. Let's go back to the identity function. Suppose I have my previous function example. Let f of x be two x plus one. We know that we just did the example, inverse of f is equal to x minus one divided by two. Let us find the composition between f and the inverse of f. So it means that we're just taking the inverse of f and substitute that for x. f of inverse of f of x is equal to simple substitution. Note the definition of composition. This is equal to f evaluated at the inverse. So wherever I see x, I'm going to use inverse of f of x. Wherever I see x, I'm going to use the inverse. So let's see what do we have. This is f of x minus 1 divided by 2. But what is the definition of f? f is saying that, hey, I have 2 times whatever it is plus 1. So I get 2 times whatever it is. I'm substituting inverse for x. What is the inverse? Inverse is x minus 1 divided by 2. x minus 1 divided by 2. I already have plus 1 as well. So simplify. 2 and 2, they cancel out. You get x minus 1 plus 1, which is just x. So if you compose f at its inverse, the output is your identity function. identity function. It's true for any composition between any function and its inverse. I expect you to ask, can I write inverse of a relation? Let us take a look at this example. Suppose I give you an example like this. I give you a relation. Consider the relation, which is written this way. You have one and two. You have five and seven. You have 10 and 11. This is your relation. 
then I ask you to find the inverse of this relation. What is the inverse of this relation? Well, you say that I remember that I have to switch x and y. So this is my x, this is my y. My x, my y. My x, my y. So the inverse of this relation, which is denoted by r to a negative one, it's not its exponent, it's not its power. This is a new symbol. So let me write it as a new symbol. This guy is equal to, well, I'm going to switch between x and y. It becomes 2 and 1, it becomes 7 and 5, and it becomes 11 and 10. This is a new relation. Relation. 